uh, lots of people of CISA, Safoni Baruni, for example, he knows everything. So that's perfect. And um, yes, correlation. Now, the correlation is a tough problem, and actually this is the source of self-interaction problem, because if we are to fuck, everything is just clear. You have two potentials, one minus the other, and you know that those two will compensate each other. If you do everything self-consistently, it's beautiful, but then if you start messing up things, introducing correlation and blah, 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 and then breaking the harmony between states and energies, then you don't know. Even if many body, there's a long history as all, all, all a theory, of it, I can tell you, but I mean, no, no. Good. Now, to introduce many body, actually, and diagrams, and, and, and not only diagrams, but the methods that are formally introduced to solve the many body problem exactly, so beyond our chief fork, we need to do a step forward in the definition of operators in quantum mechanics, introducing fields. Why are fields so important? Because in second quantization, you define the state of the system as an object that can be mathematically manipulated. It's a Fock state. That's fine. Everything is really compact compared to a formulation in terms of wave functions. Everything is very compact, but you cannot describe the time evolution of the state. So in the case of many body and the original formulation of the uh, quantum many body problem, was written in terms of paths. Indeed, there is this very, form, very much famous sentence by Dyson talking about Feynman and saying that it was crazy in thinking that you can rewrite the complexity of the interaction in terms of paths. But actually, this is the truth. You can format and rewrite all complexity if you are able to take into account all possible trajectories of the electrons. This equivalence between correlation and trajectories is at the, 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 the origin of, of the many body problem. How do you do that? First of all, you introduce those field operators that are just an uh, expansion of the state of the system at a certain point of time and space in a complete basis. This complete basis can be the Kolesham basis, single particle basis, and it's important that autonormal basis. Because of the autonormality, these fields satisfy uh, uh, commutation or anti-commutation, depends on the fermions or boson relations, and they are good objects to rewrite your problem Indeed, you can formally see that through this uh, states, so fields, you can rewrite the Hamiltonian in this form where you have an explicit, depends on the fields, and indeed you have single particle objects where you have only two fields. This is one field entering, one field exiting, while the two bodies interactions have four fields. This dependence on four fields is the source of complexity of the many body problem. Now, what you can do is to, uh, in the ground state zero temperature approach, there is a very uh, subtle but key approach to connect the state of your independent particle part to the full state. This is the so-called Gelman and Lowe theorem. This Gelman and Lowe theorem is, is very much intuitive but at the same time, it's very difficult to uh, uh, accept physically, I tell you. In the case of the Gelman-Low theorem, they introduce a prefactor of the interaction, the four-body term, is an in, a prefactor made in such a way that it goes to zero at minus infinity plus infinity and goes to one in the internal region of time. Then, the theorem states that if the limit of this eta that goes to zero exists, then you can connect the free state to the full interacting state by switching on adiabatically, slowly, the interaction. So your system goes adiabatically from a free state, non-interacting state, to a full interacting state. I mean, this was a corner, a corner in quantum many body theory because it rewrites the problem of correlation in terms of a time evolution. So you do a time evolution of this Hamiltonian with the other body switching on, and then adiabatically you go from the non-interacting to the full interacting. Great. So this means that if you expand the time-dependent ground state in powers of the interaction, and you write it explicitly, the time evolution, then you realize easily that this evolution can be made in such a way to connect mass infinity where it's free to time t where it's full interacting. 
this expansion can, is formally written in terms of T products. It's just a reason, it's just due to the fact that every interaction will appear in a con 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 concatenate form, and this concatenate form can be rewritten formally as a T product. So this is just the evolution operator of the system switched on with the debugging uh, switch on. So you have, again, a debugging switch on from the free state to the interactive state, then you rewrite this thermodynamics as an evolution operator. These evolution operators will introduce the interaction. Again, the interaction is this part, is the Columbian interaction. We introduce this interaction in, in a power expansion with the time orders with this T product. Okay, this is your evolution operator. And that defines the time order product. That is just a time product of two operators ordered uh, depending on the time relative order of the two arguments. And then the last step you need to introduce uh, the, the last tool you need to introduce the methodology is the Green's function. This is a key object in all many body uh, approaches. Why did I do this very complicated and super messy definition of the T product? That is one of the most difficult things to introduce in one slide, the T product, because it forces the definition of the Green's function. So the Green's function physically is just the uh, propagation amplitude of a fermion. It's just the um, probability the amplitude for an electron to go from time T to time, oh sorry, it is T prime. And it's X prime T prime, so there's a mistake. X prime T prime. So it's just the probability amplitude for, for going from T to T prime, from X to X prime. The point is that this trajectory can be in one direction or the other. So in one direction you say that is a fermion, an electron, going forward in time. In the other is a hole going forward in time or an electron going backward in time. The, two, the time order just imposes these two different orderings to have a minus. And this is technically due because of the expansion of the evolution operators. Unfortunately, there is no uh, simple physical intuition for that. There is no physical intuition for that. And I think this is one of the drawbacks of using zero temperature approach. But anyway, that's it. The important thing is that, yes, it's the evolution operator going in one direction or, or for an electron going in one direction or the other. The important thing is that you can expand. This Green's function is actually an object that contains inf exact information about your system because if you expand it in the, in the, in, within the completeness relation for any states of your system, then you can realize that this Green's function will have this expansion in terms of poles and the, the energies, the poles of the Green's function are the excitation energy of the system, exact excitation energy of the system. So the Green's function will be made in such a way that the spectral, the imaginary part of the Green's function, so the spectral function, so if you manage to calculate this Green's function, then you calculate the imaginary part, and the imaginary part of the Green's function is the spectral function, will just show peaks at the exact excitation energy of your system. Exact, exact, period. Excitation energy of your system. This, you get it from here. You do, this is the ground state. You expand, you see, with the excited states of the system when you, you are creating or annihilating an electrons. So here you have to include the excited states with n plus one electrons. You, put, you plug them here, and then you define those functions as sandwiches. And, and just and the exponential, you get those differences. It's an easy math. It's a lemma representation. I mean, it's mathematically, you need to do some passages. I know. The physics is just that if you accept this T product and then you define the Green's function with a T product, then if you calculate exactly, you get the exact excitation energy of your system. That's great. Then how do I get this T? How do I calculate it? Okay, again, the problem is of calculating the time evolution of this T product with this given Hamiltonian. So actually you have, where is it? Yes. One possible way 
is just to apply, that actually isn't a way to approach the problem, is to calculate the time evolution of the field operator. If you calculate the time evolution of the field operator, you can just plug it inside this definition because if you do, if you do time derivation of this g, there's time derivation of this psi. So I get time derivation of this psi, and then I have to calculate this commutator. This is lengthy, but it produces this object. EDT of the Green's function is the simple part, this single particle, Hamiltonian, plus this object. This is V, the Berkulum interaction, then you see here a T product of one, two, three, four field operators. I say, wow, what, what are you talking about? I'm talking about a simple thing. Now, you have your, your T, see the right? This is one and two, point one and point two, okay? In the free world, in the free world, this evolution is just, that's it, by free, no way. Then, the column interaction, the column interaction, how does it look like? Yes, this thing. That thing is something like, okay, an integral V R R prime, and then there are C dagger R, C dagger R prime, C R, C R prime. Now, if you draw an interaction diagram for this, what do you get? You get R, R prime. Then you have something that is created in R, annihilated in R, created in R prime, annihilated in R prime. Great. Now this is the interaction. Now, this is the free. This is the free part, right? Now, instead of this, we start from one. We, we need to arrive in two. But yet we have that interaction term. So this interaction term will appear suddenly in the middle because it's the potential. This will mean that we will have processes where we will have processes where this potential will just affect the dynamics of an electron moving from one to two, right? This is a typical interaction term. I mean, they will be scattered through this potential. But if you look inside at the big, in the middle, you see that for suddenly the electron from being alone becomes a pair because the column interaction is a two body. So they will scatter and then suddenly the second body of the column interaction will appear. I mean, the column interaction is something, okay, let's put it another way. So, in the, the in column interaction is made in such a way that I'm interacting with them. That's fine. So, when, I, when I, 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 I run, then I get the interaction, I get modified. If we are true, I get repelled. So, I move this way, but then it get repelled as well. Then it gets moving. So, in this time, suddenly, the dynamics becomes two-body dynamics. So before I was alone, suddenly I became two body dynamics. And this is what the, the theory is saying. Look, that if you want to calculate the evolution of a single body dynamics, suddenly I must get a second body involved. And then I have a two body Green's function. Is it closed? No, it's not. Because then I will continue traveling, I will interact with another body, and then it will become a four body and then it will move again. So if you do the math, if you study the math, and if you continue the math, you will see that the, le the order of this Green's function will increase. It's a, it's, it's a problem of hierarchy of n particle Green's functions. So if you rewrite exactly the time evolution, you will see that at the end, after we have 55, after 55 iterations, the Green's function will be, fee will be, will be a 55 by this Green's function. So no way to solve it. Okay, there are ways, okay, the, the, yeah, that, I mean, people have been thinking also how to solve the problem using this way, the truncation and terminator and so on and so forth. But the, the many body problem for a system of continuous, for a continuous system of a solid, no way, you have to find a way out. How do you do it? Well, you have two ways now. The, the point is, how do I rewrite this four field monster in a human readable, human and computer calculable object, then I have two methods. 
One is through Farman diagrams and the other is through the Schwinger approach. I mean, they are both complicated. No way that I do it like in, uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes. No way, no way, no way, no way. So, uh, I just uh, give you an, a, a snapshot of what you get at the end. If you want to get the math, we sit together and we do it. Actually, if, we, if I have to teach you those things, I will not use this approach, but I will use rather other approaches. But we can do it. So, with the, yes, you get this. It's a pentagon. It's a Dean pentagon. This is what you get from the Schwinger approach. From the Schwinger approach, you manage to arrive those, those four field operators in terms of objects. You define new quantities. And specifically, you define the screen interaction and the vertex functions. Then you get for free the Dyson equation, that is an equation for the G, for the Green's function, and then you get also an equation for the vertex. This is an object mathematical thing, is a mathematical object. And then you get also an equation for the uh, polarization function. Okay, every corner of this is something physical. So this is the self energy, so levels. This is, okay, again, levels. Those two are the beta Peter. They lead to the beta Peter equation. And this leads to the definition of W and, for example, plasmons. So that's physical uh, objects. So the point is that is, uh, physics is always like that, right? DFT is the same. You have this exchange, this, this, this um, Onenberg cone theorem that you write anything, everything in terms of an Onenberg cone energy functional. You give a name to things that you cannot calculate. So you write as energy functional in terms of what? Of an exchange and correlation part and actual term. So you move the things you don't know from the functional to the exchange correlation, and turn exchange correlation to the functional derivative. This, this is physics. When you don't know how to calculate, you rename it. And uh, here is the same. I mean, you are just introducing objects, and more, more are the objects, more is the complexity. Um, so you have to find approximation for those objects. And this is what is done when you really go to computers. So in YAML, for example, there is the GW approximation, that is when the vertex is neglected. This is something you will use, you will uh, calculate. Okay, this is one approach, and actually it's the one I don't fully like, because it's pretty, pretty uh, rigid, so you cannot move too much. So if you want to describe some, what, what, I, what, I, what I would say is that this approach is practically dialectic based. There is another approach that is, follows from the gelman Lotheorum theorem that is by introducing diagrams. This is what I've tried to, to draw here, so maybe you don't understand anything. So for me it's trivial because it's diagrams, but I mean, of course, there's, this is borrowed from the diagrammatic theory. For in diagrams, instead, you rewrite all orders of perturbation theory graphically. So you draw lines and scatterings and kinematics, so electrons moving around with arrows and lines and so on and so forth. It's a geometric approach, and uh, that is based on the theorem by an Italian, from Trieste, Giancarlo Vic. So, in general, in, in, when, when you do diagrammatics and you write correlation with this fancy uh, graphical way, you have something that, I mean, in the Edin's approximation, you rename everything. In the diagrammatic approach, everything is exposed, so you need to calculate it. So, in general, what you do, you choose class of diagrams, class of processes, driven by physical intuition. What I can show you, what I, if you are interested, I can show you how you get Arthur Fock for free at the very low level, of a very low order of, of diagrammatic theory. Actually, diagrammatic theory is very powerful. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. Indeed, Arthur Fock is, is what you get for free at the beginning, really. Uh, really when you warm up, you get Arthur Fock. And this is indeed Arthur Fock. Okay, so, and you get the potential again. But at the end, What you must be aware of is that there is no approximation that is valid everywhere. I mean, there is no exact solution of the many body problem at the moment, and this depends on the physical problem you are interested in. So this is something that is not clear in the Dean's approximation, in the Dean Pentagon. The Dean Pentagon is a compact and easy way to introduce the GW approximation and the beta of Peter, but it's a dialectic based. If you want to get a more wide view, you have to use diagrams, because in diagrams you would be at a certain point at the corner, 
uh, you will have like 1,000 different roads, depending on the kind of, of diagrams you will include. And there you will see that the physics is very much important and dictates the kind of approximations. So you have, for example, in the textbooks, known approximations in specific cases, where there is a short-range interaction, low-density regime, and then if you want to be conserving, so do you want to be self-interaction at any order? Do you want to conserve the energy at any order? So in that case, there are some rules that, are con that imposes how to, that tells you how to do conserving approximations. Also, the die density regime. So, this depends very much of the, on the physics. And this is the faces of people. This is Kubo, uh, Larsedin, Gordon Bain, this is um, uh, um, Salpeter, Erwin Salpeter, Bitte, uh, Wick, um, Kadanov. Uh, this is the uh, name of the guy, Rashba. I'm always confused by the two. This is it. Okay, this is Lundwist, Feynman, Dyson. This is, this is Rashba. And this is. Oh, no, I don't remember, I will tell you. I like the, the people, the physical people. That's it. That's all. Okay, now we have the break. Then there will be the lecture by, by Stefano Baroni. And then we will meet again this afternoon with the lecture about linear response. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Oh, and then there is, sorry, Paolo after Baroni.